Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So the story that we read for the children this morning was a parable that the Lord told of these two men, of this rich man and Lazarus. And this rich man fared sumptuously every day, and he was clothed in fine linen. And Lazarus was full of sores, and he was sick, and laid at at the gate of this rich man, and wished that he could eat just the crumbs that fell from his table. And they both die, and Lazarus is carried away, and he's being held close by Abraham. But the rich man is carried away, and he is being tormented by fires in Hades. And he looks up, and he can see Abraham and Lazarus a ways off. And he says, Abraham, help me. Send Lazarus down to me, that he can just dip his finger in water and and cool me down, because I'm being tormented with fire. And Abraham says, we can't do that, because there's this great gulf between us. So we can't go over to where you are, and you can't come over to us. So then he turns and he says, okay, then send Lazarus back to my father's house because I have five brothers and have him warn them so that they don't suffer the same fate that I'm suffering right now. And Abraham says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the word that they can go to, to to know what they're supposed to do. Let them listen to them. And he says, okay, but they're not going to listen to them. But if they sense, but if someone came back from the dead that would convince them. And the story ends with Abraham saying, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, then they won't be convinced, even if someone were to come back from the dead. And so this story, we're going to focus on, on this, this sort of second half of this story, with this idea of, of hearing Moses and the prophets and listening to Moses and the prophets. Because we're in this series of the way, the truth, and the life. And we're focusing on the Lord as the truth. And so we want to look at what is our relationship to the Lord's truth? And how do we come to believe what the Lord tells us? In other words, how do we come to a place in our life where we can hear Moses and the prophets? And it seems kind of like the message in this story is telling us that we need to just believe it. That if we aren't convinced by something just because it's in the Word, then that's it. Then that means that we're totally closed off and nothing will convince us and we can't be helped. But is this what faith is supposed to be? Is that what the Lord wants from all of us? Does He want us to just blindly follow whatever we're taught just because the church tells it to us? If a minister comes to us and says, well, I've done the research and this is the way you have to live, then do we just have to bow our heads and say, okay? Do we have to believe something even just because we read it in the Word? Is that it? That we just have to hear it and just take it at face value and go with it? This is a big question. And so to think about this, I want to turn to the teachings from the new church here, and I want to read the first two numbers of the book called The Doctrine of Faith. And this is an entire, an entire book that talks about what it really means to have faith. And this is how that entire book starts. This is what what they really start with telling us about faith. It says, Faith today is taken to mean no more than the thought that a thing is so because it is something the church teaches and because it is not evident to the intellect. For we are told that we must believe and not doubt. If we reply, but I don't understand... We are told that that is why it should be believed. Faith today is therefore a faith in the unknown and may be termed a blind faith. Moreover, because it is one person's assertion being received by another, it is an inherited faith. We will see in what follows that this is not a spiritual faith. Real faith is nothing else than an acknowledgement that a thing is so because it is true. For someone who possesses a real faith thinks and says, this is true, therefore I believe it. By the same token, if the same person does not understand a thing to be true, he says, I don't know whether it is true, therefore I cannot yet believe it. How am I to believe something that I don't understand? It might not be true. 
So this passage makes it clear that the Lord isn't asking us to just blindly follow whatever we're taught. That if someone says this is the truth, we aren't supposed to just accept it and and go for it. That we actually can't believe something unless we understand it. And this is kind of the way that we use the word faith in our world today, isn't it? That a lot of times we think of, well, when I don't understand what's going on, that's when my faith kicks in. Or when I don't know what the future is going to hold, but that's where my faith just has to lead me. But faith is us being able to see and understand that something is true. It has to make sense to us for us to be able to believe it. And that means that we have to be able to ask questions. We have to be able to have doubts. We have to wrestle with teachings that we're taught so that we can understand them and see how they make sense in our lives before we can genuinely believe it. So, we, so the Lord's not asking us for a blind faith. But then if we have these doubts, if we ask these questions, if we don't just accept what we're taught at face value then how do we protect ourselves from being like the rich man and his five brothers in this story? How do we we find this balance where we aren't just accepting blindly whatever we're taught, but we don't allow our doubts to turn us away from the Lord's truth so much that we totally close ourselves off to it? And that's the real question. So for that, I want to turn back to the teachings for the new church. This time we're going to go to the Arcana Celestia, and read some portions of uh, number 2468. And this talks about two basic attitudes of mind that we can have when we approach the Lord's word. There are therefore two basic attitudes of mind. The first, leading to utter foolishness and insanity. The second, to perfect intelligence and wisdom. The first occurs when someone denies everything. That is, says in their heart, that they are unable to believe anything until they are convinced by things which they can grasp in their mind and perceive with their senses. This is an attitude which leads to utter foolishness and insanity and can be termed the negative attitude. The second occurs when someone regards affirmatively the things which comprise doctrine drawn from the word. That is, when they think within themselves and believe that those things are true because the Lord has spoken them. This is an attitude that leads to perfect intelligence and wisdom and can be termed the affirmative attitude. Now I want to pause here for a second. As we might be thinking, wait a minute, that passage seems to just contradict everything that I just said to you. We just talked about this, and I said, we have to have doubts. We have to ask questions. We can't believe something unless we understand it. But then this passage seems to be saying that this affirmative attitude is just saying that I believe that something is true simply because the Lord taught it. So how does this work? How do we have this affirmative attitude while still leaving room to have doubts and ask questions and have to tease things out in our minds. This passage goes on, and it talks specifically about having doubts, and it talks about two different directions that our doubts can lead us. In addition, there are those who are in doubt before they deny something, and there are those who are in doubt before they accept affirmatively. Those in doubt before denying are people who are disposed towards a life of evil, and when carried away by that life, then whenever they think about those matters, they deny them. Those, however, in doubt before accepting affirmatively are people who are disposed towards a life of good, and when they allow themselves to be turned to that life by the Lord, then whenever they think about those matters, they accept them affirmatively." So we have this idea that that there's these two different ways that we can doubt. We can have this kind of negative doubt that leads us to deny everything. Or we can have this more affirmative doubt that leads us to belief. And for me, I think the key difference between these two is what we do with our doubt. Because I think if we say that that I doubt this, if I don't know if this is true or not, 
And so I'm just not going to try it. I'm not even going to think about it anymore until I'm convinced that it's true. That's like that negative doubt. But if we have a positive doubt, we can say, I don't see how this is true. I don't know if I can believe this yet, but I'm going to try it out. Let me give you an example. We could take a really basic truth that we are supposed to read the Lord's word, that the Lord's word is the Lord with us. And so we know that we can go to the Lord's word and and build a better relationship with him and learn things from him. And we might have doubts about this. We might say, I don't see how reading this book from thousands of years ago is going to have any positive impact on my life. And we can have that doubt, and that can make us say, so I'm going to just leave it on my shelf until someone convinces me that that book is going to help me. And once I'm convinced, then I'll open it up and I'll start studying. That's like this negative doubt, because we're never going to know whether it's true or not. Because what's going to convince us? What's our threshold that we're going to pass and say, okay, now I'm convinced. I'll go open the the word. Is it someone coming back from the dead? But if we have that same doubt, if we say the same thing and we say, I don't see how this book from thousands of years ago is going to have any impact on my life today. I don't see how reading this is going to help me at all. But then we say, but I'm going to try. I'm going to take for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to spend some time every day, and I'm going to open the Lord's Word, and I'm going to read it, and I'm going to see what I feel the Lord is teaching me here. And when we try that out, we might be amazed by what we find. It could be the same thing with prayer. We could say, I don't see how talking to the Lord is going to do anything in my life. He's not going to come and solve all my problems for me, so what good is talking to Him? But there again, if we say with that affirmative mindset, if we trust that the Lord wouldn't lie to us, so we try out the things that he teaches to us, and we say, I'll try praying. I'll try to talk to the Lord more. I'll set time aside in my life, and I will do this, and I will try to build a habit out of it. Then when we do it, we will find that our life gains so much more meaning, that we will be happier that we will feel the Lord's presence in our lives every day. And this goes for all of the Lord's teachings. That when we learn the things that the Lord teaches, sometimes we might not always understand them. We might not know exactly how the Lord's teachings apply to our lives. But if we do our best, and we try to follow the Lord as best as we can in our lives, when we try it out, that's how we're going to be convinced when we live the way the Lord tells us to, when we see the effects on our lives, when we see our relationships getting better, when we see our life being filled with more happiness and peace, then we will know that the Lord's truth is the way. And so this is our takeaway this morning. I would invite all of us over this next week to home in on something. Think about something related to to our spiritual practice, whether whether it's reading the word, whether it's prayer, whether it's doing some kind of meditation. Let's let's identify something that we can do in our lives and dedicate ourselves to trying it out every day for the next week and see what happens and see if it, see how much it affects your life. If you do a new spiritual practice and you work on it every day for a week, And afterwards, look back and say, what did this change? How did this help me? And how did this help the Lord show up for me in my life? And I think we will all be surprised to see how much even small changes can have a humongous impact on how much we feel and see the Lord in our everyday life. Amen. Please rise for a blessing.